So let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Sing of his promises evermore. Pour out your thankfulness. Let it overflow. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let me out of the desert, brought me into his streams and river of living water, turn my barren and all my burdens are lifted, took the shackles off my feet, there's no sound loud again. Mercy is new every day. Thank you, Jesus. Worthy to be praised. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.
Jesus, amen. Woo. Woo. Give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes, praise you, amen. Jesus. Amen. Praise be to God. We've been delivered from the power of darkness, amen. Amen. And conveyed into the kingdom of his son, of his love, yeah. whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. Your 
the goodness of God. in you is no darkness at all Thank you, Jesus. your perfect light you make no mistakes your wisdom is infinite Thank you, father Jesus. we look to you the author and finisher of our faith Thank you, father. run our race with endurance father Thank set our eyes on the prize you, call of god in our lives father we will hold to it thank you jesus thank you jesus praise your name father
Praise be to God. So let's give him a praise offering this after this morning. Father, we thank you and praise you. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, you may be seated this morning. Glory to Jesus. There's a lot of evil in the world. How do we fight it? Today, we're looking at our call to overcome evil with good. Before we begin, pause and pray. God, please give me the strength and humility to fight against evil. Help me to overcome evil by doing good. Amen. Today's scripture is Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome and conquered by evil, but overcome evil with good. Here's some restoration guidelines. When relating to people, sometimes we need to restore someone to a correct relationship with us, with others, or with God. Let the Lord guide you as you prayerfully follow these guidelines. Before you step into any situation, look in the mirror at your own heart and see if you are not the problem. Take your time. Waiting 24 hours allows your heart and emotions to calm before proceeding. This truly allows God to work and help you work through how to relate to others rightly. Resist the temptation to burn relational bridges. Avoid a scoffer, but pray for them. Some battles you should not fight nor win. Yield your rights by rightly responding and leaving the results to God. Avoid email, texting, and other social media outlets to resolve conflicts. Resist taking up offenses for others. Get the facts. Assumption is the lowest form of knowledge. Remember that love does not take into account a wrong suffered. Love does not keep score. I am sorry, will you forgive me, are seven of the greatest words conveyed when genuinely expressed in brokenness. Remember that even the smallest wounds take time to heal. Given the choice between extending grace or prolonging conflict, it is usually best to fall on the side of grace. We should be happy for those who are celebrating and emphasize with those who are hurting. Five steps to restoration. Pray and bring the individual situation to God. Prayer gives God time to work in your hearts and theirs. Confront the individual gently with the apparent offense. Bring up noticeable trends that avoid responsibility. Listen to their perspective regarding the offense. There are always two sides to every story. The offense may be with you rather than them. Counsel in light of their response, and if guilty, instruct according to their level of offense. After listening, your counsel may be adjusted or aborted. Pray for complete restoration for the individual or between parties. Prayer is the most crucial phase in the guidelines for restoration. Prayer allows God's grace to intervene, acknowledging the need for wisdom and supernatural intervention. 
These lessons are a result of our failures in rightly relating to others and learning how to get back on track. We realize we have more to learn and we want to remain teachable in future moments of reconciliation. May God's grace you as you do the next right thing. We want to also thank you for your ongoing faithfulness in giving. You can actually give in three different ways. Simply go to the description portion of this video on YouTube and click on the giving link. This will take you to our website. From there, you can give securely through PayPal. There is no account required. Or you can also download the Givelify app, find Living Faith Church, Exelon, Wisconsin, or simply mail a check or money order to Living Faith Church, P.O. Box 65, Exelon, Wisconsin, 54835. Please remember to pray for our nation and our leaders, along with our LFC missions families in Tanzania, Africa, India, Mexico, and Honduras. Thanks, everyone.
But praise be to God. Let's go ahead to the word of God. Let's pray and get into the word. Father, we come before you by the blood of Jesus. We bless your name. We worship you. We praise you. We thank you and give you glory and honor and praise that you put a treasure inside of us in an earthen vessel that the excellence of the power may be of God, not of ourselves, who has made us able ministers of the good news of Jesus Christ, not of the letter of the law, but of the spirit. Father, we pray that you'll open our heart, open our eyes that we might see and our ears that we might hear what you are saying to us by the Spirit of God. We pray this morning that out of my spirit would flow rivers of living water. Holy Spirit, I look to you to, and I depend upon you and ask that you would anoint my, my heart and my mouth this morning to bring forth the wisdom and, pr and truth of God to the people. And you, I pray that you'd plant these truths deep into the soil of our heart and help us not only to be hearers of the word, but Father, help us be doers of the word in Jesus' name. Amen. And all the people of God said. Amen. Amen. We have been on a series on building altars of prayer. And uh, we've kind of been chewing on this a bit. But this morning I want to talk to you about removing the curse from the land. And in Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, and I'm reading this out of the complete Jewish Bible. And it says, to Adam he said, because you listened to what your wife said and ate from the tree about which I gave you uh, the order, you are not to eat from it. The ground is cursed on your account. You will work hard to eat from it as long as you live. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat field plants. You will eat bread by the sweat of your forehead, till you return to the ground, for you were taken out of it. You are dust, and you will return to dust. Now, I wanted you to notice something here about this scripture. Um, we know that God breathed into Adam the breath of life. He formed Adam out of the dust of the ground, out of the earth. Uh, the word Adam literally means ready or red one. And uh, so Adam was taken out of the ground. He said, you came from dust, and to dust you're going to return. This was the result of sin that came into the world. Sin passed upon all men, and death passed upon all people, because all have sinned. And so there is a direct correlation from the very creation of the world. Whenever we see what's called the law, we call this the law of first mention. Whenever you see something mentioned in Scripture for the very first time, it sets a precedent for it in the rest of Scripture. And so in the book of Genesis, which is the book of beginnings, Genesis is commonly referred to as the seed plot of the Bible you can find almost every major Bible theme in Scripture in the book of Genesis. And here, what do we find? God says that, Adam, you came out of the dust, and you're going to return to the dust. And from the very creation of human beings, notice something important here. There is a direct tie between humans and the earth. Now, in our culture, Western civilization, especially in recent years, we have become more and more disconnected from the planet itself, from the earth. Now, we know in other religions of the world, there is a lot of worship of the earth itself. We have uh, uh, religions that worship trees and worship, they believe there's a spirit in things. Uh, and uh, they believe that uh, what's called animism, they believe that behind everything there's a spirit. We see the equivalent of this in the Western world in New Age religion, which New Age is really nothing new at all. It's simply Eastern mysticism and world religions that's kind of repackaged into more sophisticated terminology for Western people. But um, human beings in almost all religions of the world have been very tied to the earth itself. Uh, again, if you think of like the Native American people or you think of more indigenous people throughout the history of the world, there has definitely always been much more of a correlation and a relationship between the earth itself and the animal kingdom than with Westerners. Westerners are somewhat of an anomaly in history because we have disassociated ourselves from the earth. You know, for instance, the Bible says, and we're going to look at this in a moment, Jesus said, or, or the Proverbs, or, excuse me, uh, if I can speak here this morning. <laughs> Genesis says that, uh, that God gave us dominion over the earth, right? Now, Westerners, unfortunately, we've kind of interpreted that, that, that we're to just rule the earth, that the earth is here for our disposal. And, uh, but that's not how God interpreted it. We are stewards of the earth. We don't own this earth. We don't own the planet. God owns this planet. 
Bible says all the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. As believers, we are not owners of ourselves. We don't even own our own bodies. We, our bodies have been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we have to really renew our thinking to realize that we're simply caretakers. We're simply stewards of what God has given us. We tend to think of ourselves in Western concepts as we own things. This was one of the biggest conflicts between Native Americans and Westerners when, when Westerners came here because Native Americans did not generally, as a rule, look at ownership of things. They didn't have this possessive material mindset. And many cultures of the world uh, are, have that kind of concept. There isn't this idea that that's my house and that's, that's mine over here and this is mine and that's yours because people lived in more tribal settings where they were more communal. They shared you know, if you went and hunted a buffalo down, your whole tribe shared it. Uh, things were meant to be shared. They were meant to help each other. That has not been the concept with Western civilization. Western civilization is more like, this is my house, this is my car, this is my property, and I put a trespassing sign out, which means you stay out of it. And that's been kind of the mindset. And more and more throughout our history, especially in today's age, because we have moved most Westerners into urban settings. Uh, there's only about somewhere in the vicinity, I think last count I heard was only about 15% of Americans that live in rural America. Almost all Americans now live in urban settings, either directly in a city or surrounding a city. So we have seen this transformation over the last several decades of rural America becoming very urban America. I mean, if you watch old movies, for instance, it used to be the movies were all around farming and country living because most people lived in the, in the rural communities. I mean, even when I think when I grew up, America was much more rural, small rural farms, small little towns. Uh, we were in Exxon the other day at, at the Trout Fest talking. I was talking to somebody about how Exxon used to be a bigger town when I was a little kid. There's hardly anything there anymore. And that's really the story of rural America all over it. This is not an anomaly. I mean, rural America, for the most part, is dying. Uh, and the reason it's dying is because we've gotten centralized and, you know, big box stores and everything's big. And when you get big, you tend to get rid of small things. And so mom and pop stores and those little businesses that used to employ a bunch of people, they're not there anymore. And so people, as a result, had to move into the city to get jobs. And that's true all over the world. Now, uh, we could talk about is it good for people to live in cities? I'm not so sure that's a good thing. The Bible also even describes and says that people are not good when they're stacked on top of each other. What happens when you get people too close together? Well, the problem is that the wicked tend to corrupt the righteous. And uh, that's not my message this morning, and I'm not slamming people <laughs> that live in the city. Um, but, but, but one of the results of urbanization in America is Americans have become much more detached from the earth itself. And as a result of being detached from the earth, um, we have lost this concept, and in, even in Christendom, we've lost the concept that the earth and human beings have a direct tie to one another. Now, we're not suggesting in any way, shape, or form if somebody hears this as, well, it sounds like he's preaching New Age mysticism to me, earth worship religion. I'm not saying that at all. But we, we must not ignore the fact that what happens with human beings affects the planet. It affects the, not only the spiritual realm, it affects the natural realm. And the things we see happening in the natural realm, the earth itself and the environment and so on, is a result of a spiritual condition in the atmosphere. We know that death had not, if death had not come into the world spiritually, death would not have passed onto the planet physically. Now, you know, I, I, I don't know about, you'll hear people say, well, I don't know why God made wood ticks and why God made mosquitoes. <laughs> why did God create those things? Well, we know that, that those creatures that originally were here were not sucking your blood and doing the things they're doing because, you know, there was not, there's something perverse in mosquitoes and wood ticks and things that suck blood because life is in the blood, right? We're forbidden in Scripture to eat blood. But, um, but animals eat blood. Animals will drink blood. And uh, wood ticks and mosquitoes are an example of parasites that feed off of other animals. And so those animals, those creatures originally were not out eating, drinking blood. What were they drinking? I don't know, juice, water from the trees. I don't know. 
We know in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were not meat eaters. They were vegetarians, obviously. They were vegans. So <laughs> the world was a different place at that time, right? But when, the, when they sit in the Garden of Eden, what happens? God kills an animal, skins it out, makes them clothes to wear, showing that the innocent animal had to give its life for you because you sinned against God. And so we know that uh, there is a direct correlation between the earth and human beings. Proverbs 14.34 says, Righteousness, moral and spiritual integrity, and virtuous character exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. So what brings blessings into a nation? Godliness. What causes a nation to have problems? Ungodliness. That's what the scripture plainly says. Romans chapter 18, or 8, verses 18 through 22. This is the Passion Translation. It says, I'm convinced that any suffering we endure in less than, is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of the glory that is about to be unveiled with us, within us. Verse 19, the entire universe, now listen to this, the entire universe is standing on its tiptoes, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. That's us. For against its will, the universe itself has had to endure the empty futility resulting from the consequence of human sin. But now, with eager expectation, all creation longs for freedom from its slavery to decay to experience with us the wonderful freedom concerning uh, a coming to God's children. Verse 22, to this day, we are aware of the universal agony and groaning of creatures as if it were in the contractions of labor from childbirth. So, what is it saying here? The, the, this is a little bit wordy, but the King James says, all of creation groans and travails for the manifestation of the sons of God. Why? Because the creation itself was made subject to the curse that came into the world. Well, how did that curse come into the world? Well, we just read it came be, because of Adam's sin. God said, when Adam sinned, we're, well, we're going to look at it here in a moment, but God said to Adam, the ground is cursed because of you. The ground is cursed. The curse came into the world because sin came into the world, and because of sin, the result or consequence of sin brought the curse. Now, the reason people suffer in nations is because there's a curse in the earth itself. Now, this is interesting. We have to recognize this. This is one of the reasons in nations we see limited results in reaching people for Christ. I mean, we, we can notice this in families. You can see families where, where generation after generation after generation, they suffer with certain things in that family, dysfunctions. Maybe it's a family that alcoholism and alcoholism and alcoholism, it perpetuates itself. Now, in Western civilization, we go, oh, well, you know, it's a mental thing. Everything here is psychology. And psychology has its place. Our good friend, Brother Ron, here was talking to me about psychology because he's been trained in psychology. Psychology has its place. But the modern psychology is completely just like modern man, modern Western civilization, because we've been so inundated with secularism and naturalism, we've divorced ourselves from the realm of the spirit. So everything has an emotional or physical concept rather than a spiritual concept root to it. Until you deal with the spiritual root, though, you're not going to cut that thing off. And so things will perpetuate themselves in families, and things will perpetuate themselves in nations. This is why you will have, you will have people that will walk with God, walk with God, walk with God, and they'll crash and burn. And sometimes it's because the land itself has a spiritual dimension to it. The land itself has a spiritual curse in it. And there's a bondage and a stronghold. There are gateways and doorways that open the realm to spiritual beings that have authority and power in that land, and they'll blow people's lives to pieces. I heard a story by a particular pastor in Africa, and the Lord, uh, this, this lady came to him and said, would you come over and help us with our church over in this area? He said, we started a church about three years ago, and it began to grow and have revival, and people were coming to the Lord. We had over 300 families, 300 people in the church, I think it was, uh, and said, all of them are backslidden. They've all walked away from the Lord, and it's just the pastor and his family left. And the Lord said to him, I want you to go and help them. And he said, when he was praying about this church, and Lord, what happened to this church that all these people were on fire for God, and suddenly they're all backslidden? 
And he said, he saw in a vision, uh, this, they were by a jungle, and he said he saw in a vision this massive tornado come out of the jungle, and it hit the church and hit the families, and it blew it to pieces. He said he saw limbs and arms and legs and people like they were just torn to pieces. And the Lord said they had no concept of the spiritual warfare, the spiritual demonic dimension that they were fighting in that area, and they weren't prepared for it. And because they weren't prepared for it and didn't understand it, the enemy came in and just blew them to pieces. I mean, I can testify as a pastor. I've seen that so many times throughout the years. It's a very egregious thing where you'll see families, whole families that were once on fire for God and living for God, and they're just blown to pieces. Why? Because there's strongholds in the land. There's strongholds that get hold of families. There's strongholds that that get into people's lives and get into areas. And unless we deal with those strongholds, we're going to have limited success. This is why in the United States of America, there is such an opposition to the preaching of the gospel in many areas. There are areas of this country where people are very hard to Christ. And there are areas of the country where there is an abundance of certain types of sin. Now, why is that? Because there's a doorway or there's something that gives the enemy permission to operate in that area. See, the devil operates on legal basis. The scripture says the devil, like a roaring lion, walks about looking for whom he may devour. And it says, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. The enemy can't devour everybody. The only people he can devour, the way he devours, now he will try to attack our lives, but we have the armor of God and we can stand firm in faith against him. We're not exempt from being attacked by the enemy or coming into spiritual darkness as a believer. But we can overcome these strongholds. We can overcome the enemy's attack. But the devil is looking at people's lives and he's looking for opportunities. He's looking for doorways. He looks for something that gives him legal entry into people's lives. What's the most common thing that gives the devil entry into people's lives? Anybody know? Starts with an S and ends with an N. Sin. Right, sin. Sin is what the devil looks for. He looks for people that are not where they need to be with God, where their armor is down, where the wall comes down. Remember when the devil came to try to destroy Job, what does God say? Have you considered my faithful servant Job? And he says, you put a hedge around him, I can't get to him. So apparently the devil had gone to Job and looked to attack him, but he couldn't get at him. But he comes back the next time, and the hedge is down. The Bible says, he who breaks down a hedge, a serpent will bite. The curse without a cause will not come. There are reasons that things happen in people's lives other than just, well, I don't know why that happened. Now, I'm not here to say that everything that happens in your life is directly the result of the devil, but we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that is under the curse of darkness for the most part. The Bible says the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The Bible says the people outside of the kingdom of God, they are, they are governed and run by the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So just as we as God's people hear the voice of God and we want to obey God and we want to follow God, people that don't know Christ, they're what? They're blind. They're under demonic control. They don't know they're under demonic control. I mean, these people out in the streets right now that are rioting and burning people's buildings down and attacking people and killing people, they're under demonic control. There's hatred in their hearts. They, they hate people. They don't even know why they hate people. Why do I hate you? I don't know why, because the devil is the god of hate. And they're blinded. They're blinded by hatred. And hatred will drive people to do the craziest thing. I mean, hatred caused... the the six million Jews to be slaughtered. Hatred has caused genocides in the world, and they're happening right now. Yesterday at the uh, return, one of the people were praying for the nation of uh, of, uh, Nigeria because right now in Nigeria, there's a genocide going on. They're slaughtering... Nigerian Christians are being slaughtered by the hundreds and thousands. It's horrible. And uh, This has happened all over the world because people get hatred in their heart because there's a demonic stronghold. There's something demonic there that's opening the door and influencing people uh, to do things that they, they're just irrational. You look at people, how could people do such things? How could people treat people so badly? What would get into people that would cause them to kill women and children and have no remorse for it at all? Hatred and the devil. 
darkness, spiritual demonic forces that take hold of people's hearts and minds. And some of these things are out of the most crazy things. These are things that have been going on from generation to generation to generation to generation. People hating people, they don't even know why they hate them. They don't even know the people they hate, but they just hate them. Like the, the gal here this, we watched this morning, this young gal who was raised in Kuwait, this Muslim gal, she said, I was taught to hate Jews. And from the t I didn't even know what happened at the Holocaust. She said, I didn't know why I hated them. I just was, I hated them, and they should be killed. Well, there's a demonic force there behind those things that cause people to live in that way. And so the devil is looking for gateways and doorways and opportunity. And this is why, this is why when people are worshiping false religions, when they worship the occult, when they're involved in spiritism or other religions that have to do with spiritual forces, what they do is they seek to be controlled by these spirits. They seek to invoke these spirits. They seek for these spirits to guide them. In some religions, they call them spirit guides. Uh, in some religions, for instance, in, uh, there's religions where they, they literally, we hear today in Western civilization and New Age circles, channeling. Well, I'm channeling this ancient person. They think they're channeling a person. They're channeling a devil is what they're channeling. They're familiar spirits. Familiar spirits are spirits that know things. That's why they're called familiar. They're familiar with you. They know all about you. They know how much money you've got in your checking account. They know where you live. They know a lot about you. They're familiar spirits. This is what psychics operate under. They operate under familiar spirits. They're spirits that are familiar. Uh, you know, so I've had enough conversations with people over the years. I'll have, I've had conversations with my uncle or my aunt or my grandma or my dad came to me and they talked to me. No, they didn't. Yeah, that was them, it was them. No, they aren't. Well, I saw them and they talked to me. I don't care if you think you saw them. People that die, they don't stay on the planet. They go to heaven or they go to hell. There's two places. They don't wander around the earth. They don't haunt old houses. They're not disembodied spirits. That's all, that's all stuff that people have learned through reincarnation, through mysticism, and through watching too much psychic television uh, because people don't wander around the earth the bible said it is appointed one man wants to die and after that the judgment the bible says when the spirit departs it goes to be with god or it departs to go to the to the place of the dead which is hell there's no wandering around the planet we say well who was that then well it may have been a familiar spirit familiar spirits know about you the devil can manifest himself in many different ways. You say, well, why would the devil come and tell me certain things? I don't know. I remember uh, one particular minister this years ago. In America, years ago, there was a lot of what's called spiritism, uh, people trying to communicate. And that still goes on where people are trying to communicate with the dead, which, by the way, we're forbid to do in Scripture. We're strictly forbid to try to contact and communicate with the dead. So seances, all this nut Ouija boards, all that stuff has occultic, demonic influences to it, and it opens people up to spirits. You have to be careful what you're taking hold of uh, because you can open yourself up to a spirit, a spirit of deception. And uh, I'm not saying being scared of the devil, but we as Christians must be careful that we're not dealing with stuff, you know, like tarot cards and things like that. Well, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm into the horoscope. I used to know a gal, she was really into as astrology, I mean, you know, I'm not saying that you say, well, I'm of this. You know, do you know it's interesting? I, I, I saw a message years ago about the Zodiac, that the Zodiac has been taken over, but really the, the, the stars and the, the, what do you call them, constellations, they actually have biblical origins. They really do. It's pretty amazing. I saw this guy give a whole series on this once. I was like, wow, that's pretty amazing. The, because the Bible actually, there's points in the scripture where there's actually the gospel is, is taught through the, the constellations. It's quite fascinating. I, I, I don't know that much about it, but I've, you know, there are certain alignments. For instance, when Jesus came, there was alignment of the, the, the stars that, uh, and, and the constellations that literally led the, the uh, wise men, what we commonly call the wise men, they were astrologers. They watched the stars, and through the stars, they could tell when Messiah was going to come. So not everything like that is occultic. 
I mean, because sometimes Christians, we can't seem to stay in one ditch or the other, you know. Christians sometimes now, they're like, oh, that's, that's the devil looking at the stars. So everything's the devil to some people. You know, everything's the devil. You know, I, I love what Liz said, you know, because like, he was talking to us about meditation. Oh, meditation's of the devil. No, it's not. <laughs> We're called to meditate upon my word day and night. Transcendental meditation is of the devil. That kind of meditation, mysticism, is of the devil, but not meditating the what. The word, of, the word meditate simply means to think deeply, ponder, and mutter. And that's what we're called to do when it comes to Scripture. I'm in deep waters again here. I have these notes. I do such a good job with my notes, and I can't. Um, but anyhow... Let's go back to where we were, talking about gateways and doorways. So what Adam and Eve did is they literally opened a gateway to the devil. Because what did Adam do when he sinned in the Garden of Eden? He turned the authority that God gave him over to the enemy. He literally turned the deed to the earth over to the enemy. See, the devil did not have access to rule this planet. The enemy did not have authority or power in the earth and, and access to do what he's doing now. Somebody had to give him that. Who gave him that? Adam gave him that power. Adam gave him that authority. That's why the Bible says that, um, that Adam and Eve were to protect and guard the garden. Let's look here at the scripture in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. It says, And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of thought of his heart was only evil continually. Now, this is after the sin in the garden, and before the flood, and it says, God looked and saw that people were just evil continually, and the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things, and birds of the air. For I am sorry that I have made them, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So look at this, what happens to human beings before the flood. There's something that happened when sin came into the world, that it brought this darkness into the world and began to corrupt the human race. Now, one of the things we can kind of gather is the closer we are to the original garden, God's original design, things were much more accelerated then. People lived a lot longer. The result of the curse that came into the world was not as prevalent. Herschel al Hazbaz, he lived to what, 900 some years? And his name means when he, had, when he is gone, it will come. He was literally prophetic about the flood. Um, so these, these people lived a long time. We know there were giants in the land. There's some debate well, who are these giants? Some believe that they were just simply God's people. I truly believe from things I've studied, they were literally giants. There were giants in the earth. There, the Bible speaks of one particular king. He had a bed 18 feet long. That's a big person. I, I don't know of any basketball player that's 18 feet tall. His bed was 18 feet long. Huge. We know that not only in the Bible, but throughout cr cultures, uh, there have been records of giant people. The Native Americans have records of these giant men that would run and kill buffaloes with their bare hands. So these aren't, you know, when you have a legend or what we commonly call mythology, but it's repeated in multiple cultures around the world, it gives it validity. If, if there's lots of cultures talking about it, then it's probably, maybe it's true. Just like the worldwide flood, that's why every culture in civilization and history, almost every culture has a record of some sort of a worldwide flood. Maybe because there was a worldwide flood, Maybe that's how the dinosaurs got up on that mountain. Maybe that's why we have fossil... Maybe that's why the Cambrian era, where everything exploded in life. Maybe that's why we find pools of, of dead fossils all in one area, because the water brought them down and deposited them there. Hmm, it seems so hard to believe that, that there could be something the Bible spoke of. So the Bible just makes sense when you accept it. Amen. But our message isn't about that. But um, <laughs> the Bible says God was sorry that he made man on the earth. But notice something. Notice something about the flood. The flood was super severe. I mean, God killed every person except Noah and his family. And he killed all the animals that breathed except the ones that he put in the ark. 
And you might say, well, why would God do something so radical? Why kill everybody? Well, because one of the things we don't always think about, and this goes back to our message here about the earth being tied to human sin. Obviously, something had happened in the earth itself that had so polluted and corrupted the earth that God looked at human beings and said they are beyond redemption. I'm going to not, there's something that possibly happened in that early time period that it so polluted and embedded darkness into the earth that God knew that every generation that came after them would be corrupted and polluted. It would never stop. It would just perpetuate itself. And it had been so bad that not only had it gotten into the people, it had gotten into the animal kingdom as well. We don't know what went on, but the perversity of the human heart is as dark as the devil himself. And we don't know what all went on in those cultures, but God cleansed the earth. Now, we know something about water. Water is a type of the word of God, and it is a type of the Holy Spirit. So think what God did to the earth. He judged the earth with water. He flooded the whole earth. He flooded it and washed away the filth. The Bible says about our relationship with Christ in Ephesians chapter 5 that we are the bride of Christ and God is going to present us to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle because he's washing us with a washing of water of the word. The word of God is a type of cleansing in scripture. The Bible says we are clean through the word. Jesus said you are clean because of the word I spoke to you. The word of God has the power to clean you from sin. Now, we also know that water is a type of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus said, uh, he who believes in me out of his belly will flow rivers of living water, streams of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit. And throughout Scripture, we see that the Holy Spirit, water is a type or metaphor of the Holy Spirit. So if we think of God flooding the earth, what happens? God destroys the earth with something that's a type of the Word of God and something that's a type of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit and the Word of God always work hand in hand. So in what God did, we literally see God cleansing the planet. It's as if God says, I've got to start all over. And he only finds eight people. Eight in the Bible is the number of re new beginnings. It's always the number of new beginnings. That's why there's eight. Out of all the people, he only found eight. And so they restart. And what does God do? He rebuilds the whole human race. He's starting over with Noah. Now, we know that one day God will purify the world with fire. He put his rainbow in the sky and he said, never again will I destroy the world with a flood. But he is going to cleanse the world with fire. And we know something else from scripture. We know that fire, just like water, is also a cleansing agent. And we know that the Word of God and the Holy Spirit in Scripture are referred to metaphorically by fire. John said, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire, right? Peter said that the elements will melt with fervent heat. God is going to literally cleanse this planet someday with his fire. He is going to burn the darkness and sin out of this planet. We're not looking for a new planet. We're looking for a renewed planet. So God, the first time, cleansed the planet with water. The next time, he's going to cleanse it with fire. Now, we don't know what that's all going to look like, but the Bible does tell us that being all the elements will melt with fervent heat, what manner of people should we be? Amen. So there is coming a cleansing upon the earth in some time in the future where God will burn the sin and darkness out of the earth. And uh, so anyhow... What I'm really getting at with this is I'm trying to get you to see the direct correlation between human sin and the planet itself. This is why all of creation is groaning and travail. All of creation is under the curse that came into the earth because of human sin. And this is why the planet and the things we're seeing in the planet are, are the result of human sin. The darker human beings become, the more wicked human beings become, the more dark and sinful human beings become, the more the planet itself suffers as a result of this. We see this throughout nations. Every single nation that embraces communistic ideology and socialism ends up becoming a cesspool of darkness. They're broke. They can't raise crops. They can't feed their people. Why? Because you can't bring the blessings of God into a nation when you're killing God's people. You can't bring the blessings of God into a nation when you're 
thumbing your nose at God and rejecting God's truth. Doesn't work. Atheism, communism, and its ideology is anti God, it rejects God. And so, this is why you look at countries like communist China, which is a massive country with great resources, and yet they can't feed their people. Their infrastructure, as much as communist China wants to put on a good face and they're good at certain things, when it comes to agriculture, they can't feed their people. And why is it that America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, the nation built upon God's principles, has been called the breadbasket of the world? I remember, I, there's, a, there's a gentleman out of the Twin Cities, I can't think of his name right now, but when we first went to Africa, um, I called this guy. He's from a ministry called Cheetah Ministries International. He does a lot of work in Tanzania, Africa. He goes to African nations, and what he's trying to do is help them with their infrastructure and trying to help farmers um, grow crops and have infrastructure and build. Because what really, what really makes America a very unique country, we're not the only country, but what really the Industrial Revolution that came into America and really what propelled America into the forefront of the nations was our infrastructure. Because the things we take for granted here, for instance, we, we don't often think of all the elements that are involved by just getting, you know, you, uh, you go to your store and you buy a loaf of bread and you take it home and you put jelly on it and peanut butter and you eat it and never give it two thoughts. We never think of all the processes and steps that had to take place for that loaf of bread to get to your house. You know, farmers, tilling up ground, preparing ground, growing crops, then harvesting those crops and getting them into a grain weight and then selling those crops and getting them into, into this place to distribute and then grinding it into flour and get it to a baker and the, or to some type of place and they bake it and then they put it in packages. They have to truck it there. They have to label it there. They have to get it there and they get it to your grocery store and they drop it off and they put it on the shelf. All the processes that take place so you can go and buy a loaf of bread. And that's what makes this nation so powerful because we have that infrastructure. It was really that, that once this, other than God's mercy, that won the Second World War, because once America could figure out how to produce bombs and planes and power, the rest of the world couldn't compete with us. And that's been the truth over the years. Well, why has that happened? Is it because we're such smart people? No, it's because we got a good God. Right. Amen. Amen. And anyhow, this gentleman that goes to Africa, he says to, he says to the African people, because Africa, African nations are very wealthy in resources. As a matter of fact, Africa by the rest of the world is beginning to be looked at as the gold continent. Not because of gold, but because they have such incredible resources. But the reason African nations are oftentimes poor is they have such bad governance, or they have such broken down infrastructure. It's just never been built. And you know, it doesn't take long if you go to an African nation, and the, I love the African people. They're wonderful people. But they, it's the struggle just to get things done in some of these nations, just to get to this place because there's no roads. And this is true in developing nations all over the world. And so, and I'm not saying this in any way, shape, or form. I say this with all humility. I'm not saying this in any kind of arrogant way, like, wow, we're Americans, we got our act all together. But this is one of the things that he does say to these farmers. He said, do you think that America has great farms because uh, we just have great farms? He says, we have great farms because we have great farmers. And he said, really, if you look at early American agriculture, African agriculture has a better situation by far than, than American agriculture. But it was the drive and ingenuity and really the power of God in this nation that drove industry in America. It really was God. And, uh, and so I'm simply saying that that's why America has been so blessed, because of the hand of God on America. And that's why nations that really shouldn't be struggling and, and many times have struggled because they've had such sin in the nation and darkness. You know, when the gospel is not preached in a nation, you're going to suffer the consequences of it. The most prosperous nations on the planet. And I've had this argument with people over the years. You know, people will slam Christianity and try to downgrade Christianity and talk about how oppressive Christianity is. The nations where Christianity is preached have the best record on human rights of any nation on the planet. Now, I know America is not a perfect planet, by, perfect country by any means, and we've certainly had our own tainted past. But I will stack American history up against Chinese history any day. I will stack American history up against, against Indian history any day. 
you know, you can't condemn America without looking at other nations and saying, well, what about those nations? And so we got people here tearing down statues and condemning American history without the idea that, yeah, we've, we've screwed up a lot of things, we've done a lot of bad things, but that we've done a lot of good things as well. And you know why? Because God. Because of God. And so a nation is blessed when they follow God. And all the troubles we're seeing right now in this nation and all the troubles we've ever seen in America is because we have neglected God's principles. Because when you neglect God as a nation or as a person, you will reap the consequence, which is death. The wages of sin is death. If you, if you say to God, we don't want you in our country, if you say to God, you can't be in our education system, you're going to start producing stupid kids. We've got well-educated, dumb kids. I mean, I hate to say that, but I'm just kind of blown away by some of the college-age kids right now that I'm seeing and like, they have no concept of the real world. Well, we want socialism. Have you ever had a job and had to pay taxes in your whole life? No. Well, wait till you do. Wait till you got to pay taxes. Then talk to me about socialism and how it's a great thing. Why do you think people come to this country from socialist, communist countries to get away from it? Because they recognize it is a dark cesspool that will drain you dry. And so, again, I'm not talking about socialism and communism again this morning. <laughs> we'll have to edit this message severely. <laughs> Anyhow, where were we at before I got in that tangent? I think we need to wrap it up here. Uh, again, so the point I'm simply getting at here this morning is uh, God had to purge the earth of darkness because gateways and doorways and demonic influence had become so embedded in the planet that he couldn't get rid of it. And that age is going to come around again because Jesus says it was in the days of Noah, so it'll be in the coming of the Son of Man. So the perversion and darkness of the planet will eventually degrade into that result. We know that we're living right next door. We don't know exactly when, but we know we're living right next door to the Antichrist kingdom. The Bible says the spirit of Antichrist is in the world. So what is the spirit of Antichrist? Well, the spirit of Antichrist is anything that's against Christ. Anything that's against Christ is of the spirit of Antichrist. So any organization, any any company, anybody that rejects Christ in his teachings and doesn't want Christ, that is the spirit of Antichrist. I don't care how flower it is, it's against Christ. And if you're against Christ, you're against the Father of Christ, which is God, God the Father. You can't have the blessings of God in the planet without giving homage to the God of the planet and acknowledging him. And so when this begins to take place in a, in a land, it begins to bring the land into bondage because what it literally does is it begins to open doorways and permission for the enemy to operate. When America began to reject Christianity and biblical teachings in our public school system, our school systems began to plummet. I mean, you can trace this back. Uh, I haven't seen it for a while, but I, I remember watching, uh, looking at some statistics years ago uh, I haven't seen it for a while, but you can literally look at the education system in America, in America in general. From the 1960s, America, America was the top of the world as far as education. But from the 1960s, we began a steady decline in almost every area. And you know why? We took God out of school. We took prayer out of school. We took the Bible out of school. We legalized abortion. We started turning our back on God and thumbing and kicking God out of our, st our institutions. And from that p point on, we have seen a steady decline in the morals and, and things of America. Everything we're suffering right now, it's not rocket science. When you destroy the family, when you destroy biblical morals and morals absolutes, when you have no absolute boundaries, when children are raised... <laughs> For instance, I, I was driving home yesterday not yesterday, before yesterday from the airport, and I flipped on my radio, and this gal says, um, there's something about, a, something about a new program, and she was all excited. You know, she, I think it was public radio, and they always have their well-modulated voice on public radio, about how to, rend, how to raise gender-neutral children. 
As a parent, how you can raise general neutral children, and I'm sitting there thinking, I, I literally said out loud, as if kids aren't screwed up enough. <laughs> I mean, we've got kids right now that don't know if they're a boy or girl. And so we got, the problem is not with kids, the problem are with stupid parents. So what, are we, what does exactly that mean? Oh, Johnny, you can't play with that truck because we want to keep you neutral. Sally, we don't want a doll in your hands because we want you to determine you're a boy later on. So have we lost all sanity? I mean, how stupid can you possibly be? Oh, we've been raising boys to be boys and girls to be girls since the dawn of time. And now all of a sudden, our brilliant American mind's like, no, we don't want to tell you you're a boy. Uh, so we don't want to say you're a girl. Uh, we'll let you decide when you're 23 and you're so screwed up in the head you don't know what you are. Next thing, I'm a dinosaur. This is what happens when moral relativism becomes the law of the land. You know, it says in the book of Judges, at the beginning of Judges, it says the people sought God, and God sent them judges. By the end of the book of Judges, it says there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. What's the result of lawlessness? What's the result of boundaryless living? People in, the devil in our society tells us that the way you help people grow is you don't give them any boundaries. You don't give them absolutes. You don't tell them this is right and this is wrong. This is correct and this is incorrect. Everything's left up to our own postmodern interpretation of everything. And you know what that's doing to people? It's making them kill themselves. It's making them lose their mind. Why is suicide so high among young people today? This is, this is the most blessed generation of people materially in the history of the world. And yet they're killing themselves at record rates. Why? Why? Because they cannot live in a world without boundaries. We need boundaries. You know what boundaries do? Do you know what boundaries do? Boundaries keep you safe. They keep you safe. They give you security. They let you know that I can't go over here because if I do, I'm going to face problems. They give you warnings. That's why there's guardrails. That's why when you go to national parks, they have guardrails all the place. What does that say? Don't go over that guardrail. You'll plummet to your death. And always there's people that like, I'm going to go over the guardrail and I plummet to my death. And then we're suing the park service because the railing wasn't higher. It's, this is, I remember uh, Josh McDowell, I think, no, it, was, it, was, it wasn't Josh McDowell, it was uh, Francis Schaeffer said years ago, this is the dilemma that humanists and secularists and naturalists have, is if you build a bridge across a chasm and it only reaches halfway, no matter how good your intentions, it still only reaches halfway. And that is exactly what human beings right now are trying to do with God. We are trying to solve our problems with a bridge that only reaches halfway. And in our stupidity, in our rebellion, in our arrogance, in our refusal to humble ourselves before God as a nation, we refuse to acknowledge the fact that we cannot solve our own problems because they have a spiritual dimension that in the natural realm we're incapable of solving. And until we turn back to God, we will never solve these problems. Because you can't change the human heart through intellectualism. You just end up with smart people that hate others. You end up with smart criminals. And they run for Congress. LAUGHTER so the bottom line is we have to humble ourselves under the hand of God and seek his face and cry, upon, cry out to God for mercy and forgiveness so that God will come and reign upon our land and open people's eyes and we tear down these strongholds and tear down these demonic forces that are blinding people's minds so that when we talk to them about God, they have ears to hear 
and they have eyes to see, and they'll turn to God. What did Paul say? Turning them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. That's what we're here for. That's our whole mission, folks. Turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God because we used to be in that situation. That was where we were. Paul said, it's but by the grace of God go I. So I don't see these things. I, I know I'm kind of blast people and I'm kind of like Donald Trumpish sometimes, but, uh, but I don't say it because I hate people. I say it because we need direct speech. We need to hear the truth and we need to wake up. Slap us upside the head if that's what it takes. Wake us up. I'm driving toward the cliff and I'm going to crash and burn. And we don't need to go, oh, you know, maybe slow down. You won't burn so bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, we need to jump out and stop them if necessary. Throw our bodies in front of the car to stop them. Whatever the case may be, to rescue those who are heading toward death. Amen? Rescue those who are heading toward death. Well, why don't you stand to your feet this morning? Heavenly Father, we rejoice in you. We praise you. We thank you. We thank you that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And Father, we rejoice in you that you brought us into the world for such a time as this to turn people from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. So Father, we want to be men and women of God who walk in your ways and keep your commandment. This morning, if you are not here and are, excuse me, you are here. <laughs> I sound like Joe Biden now. <laughs> What came on me? <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you are here, <laughs> which I hope you are, <laughs> and you're just not where you need to be with God, let's, let's get that right this morning. Amen? Amen? The Bible says, he who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we're just going to pray a prayer together here. It's that simple. And we're ready to turn from our sin and turn from our life of darkness and Turn from those things, even as a Christian, turn away from those things that are slowing us down and keeping us from running our race. Let's just pray this together. Oh God, I confess that I've sinned against you. I've gone my own way. I've turned my back on you. I've acted in rebellion. I've acted in human pride. And I'm sorry. I ask you to forgive me. I renounce my sin. I renounce this world, and I renounce the enemy, and I surrender my life to you. Come into my life. Make me a new creation. Change my heart. Take out of me the stony heart and put your heart within me so that I can walk in your ways and keep your commandments. And so from this day forward, I will live for you with all my heart, with all of my soul, and with all of my strength, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, may the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you, may the Lord be gracious unto you, and lift up his countenance upon you, and grant you his peace, in Jesus' name. If you need prayer, come see us afterwards, we'd be glad to pray with you.